check, check, check. Yeah, y'all, y'all can clap for that. Y'all can clap for that. Well, good morning, Bridge fam. Ooh, I love that. I love that. Well, if we have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Derek Brown. I'm one of the pastors here at Bridge Church. Just want to say welcome. Thank y'all for showing up. And um, anybody who knows me, this will come to no surprise to you. Um, if we have not met, this might be some new information. But me, I'm the type of guy that loves entertainment. I love watching sports. I love reading books when I have the opportunity to. And I absolutely love watching movies. Now, speaking of movies, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for a, a character arc with a redemption story. Amen? Like, I, I love that. There's so many options. But the one I wanted to share with you all today, you know, this, this, this brother gets a bad rep because his, his reputation precedes him every year. Can we show a picture of who I want to talk about real quick? Think it's coming? <laughs> this guy, the Grinch that stole Christmas. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this brother right here. He's green with envy. He, he's known as just this, this, this mean dude that every time Christmas comes around, everybody's like, why are you being a Grinch? You know, he, his, his upbringing, he did not have a good upbringing. And so um, he often looked down on this town called Whoville. And the Who's, they were actually uh, uh, just a group of people that just, that were loved, they were friendly, they were happy. And around Christmas time, what this dude would do, he would dress up as Santa Claus, and he would go and take their presents, and he would proceed to dump them over the mountain. When he did that, but well here's the thing, I'm, I'm kind of fast forwarding a little bit. While he was doing this, you know, when Christmas came, he was like, what's going on? Like the Who's, they were still celebrating, they were singing. They were together. He came to the realization that this thing about this thing Christmas, this holiday this season Christmas, there was a bigger meaning than what he thought, which was all about material things. There was actually something deeper that he couldn't steal from them. And at the end of the day, I know he had a change of heart in the who's. They actually welcomed him. They celebrated Christmas with him, him and his dog, Max. And again, I love a redemption story. He was redeemed just through that. And so I just wanted to pose a question this morning. Do you know anybody, is there anybody in your circle, maybe it's yourself, that has a changed life? Do you know anybody in your life you've seen just a a, a transformation in their life? Today I actually want to talk about a gentleman who had a change in his life, but more importantly, a change orchestrated by God. The brother we want to talk about today, he goes by the name of Saul, eventually Paul. His name was changed, but we're going to talk about his original name, which was Saul. And the thing I love about this brother is he, he, gets, a, he gets a bad rep because of his reputation, but I just love that through just the story, we get to learn about the good things that he's done after his transformation. Amen? Amen. Now, speaking about God, I got a promise I want to share with y'all. As preparing for, when I was preparing for this message, there was a, a, a promise, a promise that I learned. And here it is. God can use anyone he chooses to do the work for his kingdom. I repeat that God can use anyone he chooses to do the work for his kingdom. Here's why I share that. I want to give you a little background about Saul. So I know last week Pastor Rob kind of t- Pastor Rob kind of touched on it a little bit. But there was this brother named Stephen who was preaching the word of God. And he was a martyr. He got stoned to death. His brother Saul, he actually approved it. He was the one approved of Stephen being killed. And then we're going to fast forward a little bit. Um, If you haven't been with us, we're actually in this series called Unfiltered Church. We've been going through the book of Acts in the early church, and we're going to continue that this morning. So if you want to come with me, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9 this morning. We're not going to go through the entirety of the chapter, but there's a few things that we're going to talk about learning about this brother Saul. 
And so, again, we know he approved of this. This is why I say this is, this is the promise that, he, that God can use anyone he chooses for the work of his kingdom. And this is a prime example. So um, as we learn a little bit about Saul, can we go to uh, Acts chapter 9? We're going to go right away, verses 1 through 3. Can we get that up there, please? There we go. And this is how it starts. It says, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. I just want to take a look at a few things here. Saul was a man who was raised by Pharisees taught religion, so he already had an idea of what he thought was right. He went to the point of, again, it says here, he went to get permission to seek out individuals who, it says here, belong to the way. I believe next week we're going to learn a little bit more about this. These were actually Christians. They weren't called Christians until Antioch, and I'm going to leave that to Elder Leon to explain that, Uh, but belong to the way. So he was seeking out permission to go get these Christians to persecute. And as we see from these scripture verses, it wasn't just the men. It was the women as well. I don't know about you. And, and I want to I wanna give you just a, a little bit of context. Jerusalem and Damascus are about 175 miles away from one another. The word says this was, it was a, it was a six day journey. If I don't like somebody, <laughs> if, 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 me, if me and my wife, if we have a, a disagreement, I don't necessarily even want to be in the same room. I for sure am not about to travel 175 miles <laughs> to have an argument. That is a lot of hate. Again, he thought he was doing what was right. He thought that these people, it says the Lord's disciples were speaking blasphemous which in layman's terms, basically, they were insulting God or they were using his name in vain because of what he thought he knew. He didn't know he was doing wrong. And so he had so much hate and anger in his heart because he, was, he thought he was doing it for the Lord that he was like, I need, I need to go get them 175 miles away. Like he wasn't content with persecuting the church with the death of Stephen. He said, no, they scattered too. I got to go get them as well. You might be asking yourself, because I ask myself this question, why should that give me hope? Why should that give us hope? And I know we talked about this early in the year. We're going to continue to talk about it. But here's why. Because God's grace is sufficient for anybody and everybody. When we think about Saul and that promise that I mentioned, he can use anyone he chooses to do the work of his kingdom. Saul didn't choose it. God chose him. His grace is sufficient for any and everybody. If he can use Saul, he can use me, he can use you, He can use those guys you drive out on the interstate, drive right by and don't even look at them. He can use them. Dare I say he can use a little, a a three-year-old baby. If he can use Saul, he can use anybody. That's what gives me hope. And I hope that's what gives you hope. And because of that promise that he can use anybody, and we see through the scripture that he used Saul, we get to see the Lord's power on display. Because of Saul's conversion, we get to see the power of Jesus on display. Now, y'all might be asking what that word conversion is, and I got a definition here for you. Not to be confused. Now, they're very similar with the word, the word repentance and conversion. They're, they're very similar, but there's also some differences there. So as we look at this word conversion, 
It says, a spiritual turning away from sin in repentance and to Christ in faith. Again, in layman's terms, it just means I'm, I'm changing my life around for Christ. Repentance is like I'm, I'm turning away from my sin. A conversion is like I'm, I'm making a life change that models Christ. What we're about to look at here shortly is a mission filled and started off with hate turned into a message from heaven. So we're going to continue to, again, we're going to uh, skip a few scripture verses, but we're going to go right into the, ne- the next verse. I've got a few verses for you. Uh, we're going to go into Acts chapter 9. We're still in chapter 9. Let's look at verses 4 through 6. Here's what it reads. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. He replied, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. That's personal. Again, Saul thought he was doing the right thing. I can only imagine how he felt hearing directly from Jesus himself, why are you persecuting? Oh, I thought I was doing it in your name, Lord. I thought I was doing the right thing. You were actually persecuting me. I know for me, early on, and I know we, we, we still say this and we still believe it, but I even had to, I had, to, I had to gut check myself. Why don't they get it, God? <laughs> if only they knew what you have for them, why don't they get it? There are times where I found myself even looking down on people like, why? Why don't they get it? Thinking I'm having the right thoughts. And then I had to have a reality check. Eric, you didn't have it all together yourself either. You didn't start off where you are. What makes you think you could have that thought for those when you were once there yourself? I'm sorry for persecuting you, Saul. I'm pretty sure that had to be a tough pill to swallow for Saul because it was a tough pill to swallow for myself. And then at this point, what the scripture verse that I don't have, um, there, were, there were a couple guys that were with him. And so they seen and they heard the message. And so they knew what was going on. But Saul himself, it said he was blinded. There were like scales that were over his eyes. So when it talks about get up and go into the city, he actually had to have help because he couldn't see. And so he had people to take him into the city. And so we're going to continue with the next scripture verses. Um, we're going to go chapter, um, still in chapter 9, verses 10 through 12. And this is what it says. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. I'm going to pause because we talked about Ananias last week. This is not the same Ananias. This is a different Ananias, okay? And it says, the Lord called him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. So Saul started his journey to Damascus on a mission of hate. But he was soon to be intercepted. Obviously, he was already intercepted by Jesus, but he was going to be intercepted by a man named Ananias that was actually going to give him a new mission. And again, that message came from heaven itself. This is what I love. And we're going to get to it here in a little bit. Ananias and Saul, they didn't know each other. They didn't have a clue that each other, well, Saul didn't have a clue that Ananias existed. However, Ananias knew of Saul because, just like the Grinch, he had a reputation that preceded him. It's funny how God starts to connect the dots. 
sometimes in your life, you're going to have a, a moment, and we, we learned this in Jonah, where God's going to have to sit your behind down. He's going to have to sit you down. In Saul's case, he even took his vision. Not only am I going to sit you down, you ain't even seeing what I want you to see, so I'm going to take that from you. Because I just need you to be with me. And I just need you to hear what I want to tell you. And I love, he didn't, even, he, didn't, he didn't give Saul everything. He gave him a vision of who he was going to see. Not necessarily what he was going to do. Who he was going to see. So he didn't even give him the full picture. But just watch how God connects these dots. Can we go to the next scripture verse? Acts 13 through 17. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man, as I just mentioned, and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he will suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to draw a funny parallel. Our previous series, we heard about a gentleman who was tasked with a mission from God and decided to turn the other way. Here we have another man who was tasked with a mission from God. But while he may have had some reservations, he still decided to listen and be obedient. As we look at these scripture verses, and this is what I love, and this is why it's very important to understand that when we, when we think about, as, as, as Rai said, that when Jesus came and he died on the cross, that was very important. The relationship between us and him was that important. And we see the fruit of this relationship here. And Ananias was having a conversation with Jesus. He brought to him his reservation. He didn't say, I'm not going to do it, but this is how I feel. This is how I feel. I got some reservations. I'm going to do what you said, but this man was killing people. I don't know who needed to hear this today. But God loves you. You can bring to him your reservations. You can bring to him your situations. You can bring to him your fears, your concerns. You can bring it all to him. And just watch what he does for you. He wants to have a relationship. We see Ananias having a conversation with his Lord and Savior. Amen? And this is what else I love. This, this, is, where the, this is where the dots are connected. Saul didn't know what he was going to do. He knew where he was going to go, and he knew there was somebody that was going to be there that he was going to encounter. Once he got there, the vision, and both these gentlemen had a vision, <laughs> before entering the city. But on the road to Damascus, that vision actually turned into an actual encounter with Jesus Christ himself. And Ananias had the message that he needed to deliver. The message that Saul didn't even know he was going to get, that message was delivered through Ananias, through somebody else. And the thing I love, this is a picture of, of Saul's conversion, of his life change, of his transformation. And this is the confirmation. And Ananias acknowledged Saul's conversion, as we can see in the scripture verse right here. Brother Saul. He didn't call him just Saul. He didn't call him by his reputation murderous Saul, envious Saul, blasphemous Saul. He didn't call Brother Saul. I'm acknowledging your life change to one in a life Feel more with Christ and of Christ. And he confirmed a few things here. Here's the first. The Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road. So he confirmed that Jesus appeared to Saul. Has sent me. 
he confirmed that Jesus sent him. He didn't come on his own accord, that Jesus sent him. That you may see again. That Jesus has healing for you. In your situation, in your hopelessness, in your pain, he has healing for you. And be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right after that, and again, we, we, we're not going to go through the whole thing, but the scripture verses read, it says that Saul was baptized. Saul got up. Those scale-like things that were over his eyes fell off, and he was able to see again. Because of the life change and transformation that he had, he was a new person, and he was ready to do the right work that God called him to do. So thinking about that promise, that God can use anyone, he chooses to do the work for his kingdom. We're about to see the proof of that promise. Here's the proof. It's, it's, it's coming, slowly but surely. Maybe not. I know I know we we dealing with some technical difficulties. But if it pops up, here, here's a proof. This is Saul. Saul went from self-righteous and ruthless through brokenness and helplessness to doing missionary work and being the preacher of the early church. This is what's fascinating to me. He was in Damascus. He was originally going there to persecute men and women for the work that he thought he was doing was wrong. And he actually, in these same synagogues, he was, he was seeking out to arrest folk. He was actually preaching in these same synagogues. The same one. And not everybody received his conversion, his life change, his transformation warmly. There were actually plots like, they were plotting to kill him, to take his life. Like, he had, he had a couple of haters. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I don't know if I could trust this dude. Like, what, what if he's doing this just to get closer to us to really fulfill his mission? They didn't know. Someone were leaning out of fear. But what I love was there, there was also some people, while he was preaching God's word in these cities, there were people that were converted and they actually learned about these plots and they were able to save his life. So Saul went from Damascus preaching in the synagogues back to Jerusalem, again, where he was already persecuting people, Christians, the followers of the way. And he's doing the same thing. He's preaching the word. He's hanging around with these disciples, the disciples that he, he wanted to seek out and arrest and kill. This is the group that he's hanging around. And just like in Damascus, the same thing happened. You got some people who's, who's cool with him. You got some people who's like, man, why should we follow him? Much like Ananias, this is where, and I know we talked about, I believe earlier this year, this is where we talked about that brother Bar Barnabas. You got the disciples who were just like, man, I don't, I don't even know. This dude was just killing people. He's just arresting people. Why should we follow him? Barnabas confirmed. He had an encounter with Jesus. What you see right now is not all act. It's not a smoke and mirrors. This is for real life change. So this is why we should listen and follow him. Barnabas helped where nobody else would. And again, not everybody received his transformation warmly. Just like in Damascus, there were plots to kill him in, in Jerusalem as well. And just like in Damascus, when the believers, the people who followed Jesus heard about this, they again got him out of a, a tough spot where he wouldn't be killed. And because of that, this is what we're going to look at. The, this is the last scripture verse I have from you. This is Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Can we put that scripture verse up? Then the church 
throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in fear or reverence of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Its numbers increased. Saul was set out on a mission to destroy the early church. Saul had an encounter with Jesus. Ananias gave Saul his new mission. And because of Saul's conversion, we saw that the church expanded beyond even those two cities. And it grew in its numbers. As I close this morning, I want to ask you a question. I'm going to have my boys come up. I got a couple questions. Does God have you in this position right now? The position of Saul. Where he has you sitting in wait for him. That can be a tough spot. Especially in our world today where we're constantly going, we're constantly busy. We want to know the answers to everything. What, why, who, what, all that stuff. God, why am I just sitting here? What am I waiting for? I know we learned a few weeks ago. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this was, this was the, the, the 120. Like, what, what are we waiting for? Jesus asked us to sit. <laughs> I'm getting a little anxious. What's the deal? I just need you to sit. I'm not going to tell you the full picture of everything. I just need you to sit. And when I'm ready, you'll know. Because I'm going to send somebody. I'm going to send you an Ananias that's going to give you the word and the message of what I need you to do that's going to get you up from the time that I sat you in to fulfill the purpose that I have for your life. And there's going to be times. <laughs> there's going to be times where it gets hard. I didn't get permission from my sister, so I won't share her name, but this past week at group she mentioned that somebody spoke to her. She, she just got, was getting baptized and somebody gave her a message. It's like, man, the enemy doesn't like this. He's going to come after you. It's going to be hard. That's another promise. He, he, didn't, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't just say it's going to be sunshine and rainbows. We're going to go through some things. But this is what I love. Just like Saul when he was back in Jerusalem, being plotted against, not knowing, is anybody going to follow me? He'll send you a Barnabas. That even while you're up and going through it, they're going to have somebody that he's going to have somebody that's going to encourage you. That's going to help lift you up. That's going to help push you when you feel like stopping. I don't know if I could do this, Lord. Yes, you can. I don't know if I got it in me, Lord. Yes, you do. I'm going to send somebody to help you on this mission I gave you. You may not get the full answers when you wanted to, but it's when he wants you to have it. So here's a few things, the three questions I want to share with you, and then we're going to have Ryan sing and just, and just go to the Lord with these questions. Here's the first one. Is there anything that God is having you wait on him for? You might not know the answer to this question, that's good. But there is one who does. So we're going to sit in a moment. We're going to be ministered to. But ask God, what is it that you have me sitting and wait for? What is it that you need me to do? What do my eyes need to be blinded from seeing? What do you need me to wait for?
And then here's the second one. There we are. What is one area of your life that you can use a conversion like change? Here's the thing that I didn't share. While Saul went through a conversion, and again, eventually his name would be changed to Paul. Why Saul, while he was thinking he was doing the right thing, again, raised biblically, raised by the Pharisees, so he, he thought he knew what was going on. He didn't even know he needed a conversion. He didn't know. Sometimes we can get that way as well. Some, we think we're doing the right thing. We think we're saying the right thing. We think we're thinking the right way. So our posture is already, we don't even think we need to change. You want to have breakthrough in your marriage? Something needs to change. And it's not necessarily always your spouse. You want to have breakthrough on your job? Something needs to change. And it's not necessarily always your coworkers or your boss. You want to see breakthrough in your household? Something needs to change. And it's not always your kids. You want to see breakthrough in your friendships? Something needs to change and it's not always your friends. You want to see breakthrough in your life? Something needs to change and it has to happen beyond a Sunday morning. And then here's the last thing. The last question. I hope y'all taking these down. Who are the friends in my life that would hold me to this change? I love having friends in my life that's going to encourage me. I love having friends that's in my life that's going to, that's going to help push me when I when I, I don't feel like I have nothing else to give. When I'm feeling down, I love having friends in my life that's going to pick me up. Do you look good? Do you sound good? But I also love having friends in my life that's going to hold me accountable. Not just somebody that we're going to get together and hang out, or I like, I like what you say, or I like, I like telling you this because we have the same thing in common. That's only going to take me so far. I like the friends in my life that's going to hold me accountable because they see the potential in me. Because they see how God sees me. Yeah, girl. Yeah, bro. They wrong. So, so. Hey, but, get, but what are you going to do? What has God called you to do? Is that how he wants you to respond to your spouse? Is that how he wants you to respond to your mom and dad? Is that how he wants you to respond to his child on the job? The battle is not between flesh and blood. There's a spiritual battle going on, but the enemy may think it's that person in front of you. Get somebody in your life that's not only going to make you feel good about yourself, but that's going to challenge you a little bit. That's going to make you, ugh. Again, like, that, ugh. That's going to make you feel like Jesus is saying, why are you persecuting me? Ugh. You got it, God. So, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for being God and God alone. God, we thank you for the story of Saul, who's later be known by Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament. God, we thank you that we get to see the change that has happened, Lord. And I pray that we are the type of children of God, that we have the discernment to know if we're not talking, if we're not thinking, if we're not responding the way that you want us to respond, Lord, we ask that you, you, you put the scales over our eyes, God. Sit us down. Have us wait till you want us to move.
We don't want to be self-righteous. We want your righteousness. Thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to live in and through us, to go before us, to correct us when we're wrong. It is a gift. Thank you for loving us, God. And so I just pray. I pray, I pray, I pray that we are ready to change. Not just a little bit, but fully commit and submit our lives unto you. Thank you for choosing us to do the work of your kingdom. God, we love you. We appreciate you. God, we honor you. That's in Jesus' name. Amen.